Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the um, Tuesday, March 31st, uh, 2020 uh, Board of Selectmen's meeting. Uh, I'll read the agenda. At uh, 7 o'clock, we have citizens' input. 7.05, informational update on the coronavirus. 7.10, public, uh, public hearing. Helix Foxborough LLC doing business as Helix Esports. 7.20, town elections and town meeting postponement discussion and possible vote. 7.30, change of official posting location for open meeting for the town of Foxborough. 7.40, COVID-19 state of emergency labor policy review and possible vote. Uh, 7.55, uh, uh, assistant town managers update. 8.05, town managers update. 8.15, selectmen's update. And then we have uh, half a dozen or so uh, action items. Uh, Ed, you wanna lead us in? Uh... Certainly. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Thank uh, we're doing a pretty good job with that, so bear with us if you're out there and the uh, uh, camera is a little lagging behind with um, who's speaking at the time. Uh, we're going to start with uh, citizens' input. Uh, usually we look out in the audience, no one's here, but I already know that there is a citizen that uh, sent Lear a um, suggestion, and uh, we're going to have Lear uh, see if this works, Lear, and read it for us. Sure, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, great. So Joe Garrity reached out to me um, about an item that will be on the agenda a little bit later, and I can always read this again if I need to come back to it. But it's regarding the discussion for the change to Election Day. Um, he suggests postponing Election Day to June 2nd because Rhode Island and some other states like Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Delaware, New Jersey, Maryland, Washington, D.C., South Dakota, Montana, New Mexico, and Indiana have also postponed their presidential primaries from April 28th to June 2nd. So um, he feels like June 2nd makes sense as the best day. Okay, great. Thank you for the input, Joe. Um, anybody else have anything for citizens' input? Okay, great. Um, Bill, uh, let's uh, update us on uh, what's going on in the state and here in the town. So, um, so good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for uh, for being and joining us with us tonight. So, the um, there are a couple things. Just a few. I've been doing daily updates uh, with the community on the on the on the pandemic and the effect on Foxborough as a, as a community. Uh, I'll continue to do those at ten o'clock every morning now. Uh, we we were doing at different times in the afternoon, realizing that. Uh, the different updates that are coming from both the state and the president were, uh, were, were getting pushed out later and later, so we finally decided that we'll just do it in the morning uh, and just report on the information that occurred the day before. So uh, I'm moving that, that uh, those updates to the, to the, the, uh, to the 10 o'clock morning in the, in the morning uh, period. Um, just a couple other things that, uh, that were, uh, that our current, uh, the health department has frequently updated its resources related to COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and you can you can check that out on the town of Foxborough's webpage www.foxboroughma.gov, um, and then on the partial listing of the open restaurants in Foxborough can also be found on that same page. Um, we've been trying to support local businesses to the greatest degree possible, given the circumstances that we're operating under. And uh, operators uh, can contact John Robertson at jrobertson at foxboroughma.gov. He's the uh, He's, he's working in the, in the, he's one of the inspectors in the, um, in the health department and he's been helping try to keep that information up to date on their website and gathering that information, keeping me, keeping, giving me reports as well. So he's been really, really helpful in that regard. The health department has, a, has heard concerns regarding essential services. Uh, the state continues to issue new guidelines regarding essential services and what they mean. And the, and the Board of Health has been reviewing these updates on a regular basis and we've been talking uh, on, a, on a daily basis about what those actually mean. There's different interpretations as to what it means and unfortunately it's confusing at best, so we're doing the best we can to try and keep, uh, keep everything in line uh, based on new and daily requirements that's coming out from the federal and state government. Uh, some things that we do know uh, are, are pretty clear is that pet groomers, including grooming areas at, at Petco, 
are not allowed to hurt, occur during this time period. It's not considered essential service. Though an, animal, animal food and uh, support for animals uh, beyond that is actually still uh, supported and, and that's why Petco can stay open. Uh, personal care services such as tanning, hair, nail salons, massage services are, are not uh, allowed during this period of time as well. Um, there is some question, uh, I, I know that uh, Bass Pro has, uh, was open, uh, and then, but actually uh, there was action to try and close them tonight at 6 o'clock, so, but there was actually new regulations that came out today as well as, as late as 4 o'clock this afternoon. So there's still some interpretation about that, but as of right now, they are they, they are going to be closed, except for uh, they will be doing curbside services and uh, doing repairs on boats, things like that. Those are still considered to be acceptable actions. And so they do have some limited services they will continue to provide. So those are the latest updates on things going on in, the, in and around Foxborough, just to be to bring you up to date on those things. On the latest numbers, they came out at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, there are uh, now 738 cases in Norfolk County, 6,620 cases statewide, and 89 deaths. Um, there are, since Monday, those cases increased by 110. There were 628 cases as of yesterday. It's now 738 cases in Norfolk County. Um, and uh, compared to today, so 110 cases more. Um, in terms of the um, number of hospitalizations, there are uh, 562 cases hospitalized statewide, uh, 1,900 are not hospitalized, and 4,100 are still under investigation to determine whether or not they will, will go in that dire either direction. Um, there are 13 uh, total deaths in, in Norfolk County alone. So. Uh, those numbers are increasing, but yet here in Foxborough, I'm pleased to report there are nine cases, reported cases of COVID-19 that have been confirmed, and four uh, four people have actually uh, have actually uh, become healthy again. So that's that's a good sign in that regard. So uh, our numbers are actually have leveled <coughs> off a little bit, and I'm I'm pleased to see that though that's a that's a good sign for at least in this community. Uh, though I did hear today that, and the governor reported yesterday that. Uh, he does expect that the peak will occur in the next seven to seven to, uh, seven to fourteen days, um, and that uh, I've also uh, heard from Rob Vadone today, who saw something on a national level saying that the, that the next fifteen days we will see the peak should be occurring here in, in the United States. So uh, obviously it's uh, it's a it's an evolving situation. Uh, schools have been closed until May fourth, and I just also saw that the. Uh, that uh, non-essential businesses will be closed until May 4th as well. So we'll continue to keep you updated uh, on all the information that we have, especially as it relates to Foxboro. We've had some good news stories to report, and uh, we've been following those on, on the Facebook Live broadcast, some, some of the good things that are going on around town. And I have one other thing that I'll talk about later in my report tonight about something that's good that's going to be happening uh, in the next few weeks. All right, so that's all I have for that. Uh, thank you for the update, Bill. You're welcome. <coughs> uh, 710, uh, we have a public hearing. The Board of Selectmen, acting as the local licensing authority pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 138, will conduct a public hearing on Tuesday, March 31st, 2020, beginning at 7, 10 p.m. in the Gala Meeting Room, Town Hall, South Street, Foxborough, Mass, on the application of an on-premises annual all-alcohol restaurant license authorized by special legislation Chapter 201, the Acts of 2007, the Helix Foxboro LLC, doing business as Helix Esports 23 Patriots Place, Foxboro, Mass. Manager John Vandeveld. Additionally, license requests approval of a common vigiler and seven day entertainment license for the established hours of operation. All interested parties are welcome to attend. All right. Good you evening. Have the floor. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Stephen Miller, McDermott, Quilty, and Miller. Uh, members, uh, good evening. I have with me Murphy Vandeveld and his son, John, also known as Jack. <laughs> uh, I think he prefers Jack, so um, the, uh, we're seeking your approval for a new concept to. Uh, go into Patriot Place. It's uh, a e Helix Esports, which is uh, Esports Gaming. 
Uh, I'm going to let them explain the concept. I'm just going to talk about the general overview because I have no idea what uh, <laughs> what's involved. Um, but I know it's now a very hot item. Uh, Murphy and John uh, currently own and operate a place in North Bergen, New Jersey. Uh, Murphy's family is, uh, they live in Wellesley, so they're Massachusetts residents. Uh, They've operated the place. They've had a liquor license in New Jersey for this type of operation since 2017. Uh, they have a uh, good reputation down there. They've had a great operation. The, uh, their, uh, John, who's going to be the proposed manager of record, took the place, as his father said, from demolition to uh, opening and then operated the existing place down in North Bergen, and, and he's doing the same thing here along with his father, so, and he will be the manager of record, and he will be on site. The, um, there will be, and they'll explain it to you a little bit more, uh, but there will be approximately 100 to 120 uh, gaming machines, video gaming machines on site. They have a very strong protocol as far as um, alcohol service and um, the, the total operation, each machine is, um, costs approximately $2,000. So uh, their staff, which will be totally trip, the entire staff will be TIPS trained, um, will, will be monitoring uh, not only the areas around uh, with the lounge, but the areas where the gaming takes place for a number of reasons, not only just the service of alcohol, but to uh, monitor and help on the machines and uh, make sure that alcohol isn't passed off or uh, spills. So they have a very strong protocol, which they've developed since they've opened in New Jersey. Um, they did have the opportunity to meet with Lieutenant Noonan and describe um, their process and protocol and um, answer his questions. And um, I think you may have something, the uh, Lieutenant said he was gonna send something to you uh, based on our meeting and he was going to, I guess, reach out to the North Bergen Police Department to get some input on their existing operation. They have a uh, five-year lease with a five-year option, uh, and um, the place is ready to go. Um, it's built and ready to go, and besides your approval, we're gonna need, I guess, the governor's <laughs> approval. Um, so I, I'll let Murphy and, and Jack um, describe a little bit more of what, the, what goes on there. Well, I'll, I'll take first stab at it, then I'll let the experts really talk about it. Um, you know, as, as, as Steve mentioned, we're, we've been in the business, um, uh, in the entertainment business down in New Jersey since 2017. We opened um, what is now today um, uh, the largest esports gaming center in the United States, based on not by footprint, but by a number of permanent stations. Um, our facility here in, in uh, Foxborough will be one of the top five largest uh, in the United States, maybe top three. Um, you know, we're really excited about uh, you know partnering uh, and working with uh, Patriot Place and the uh, the Craft Sports Entertainment Group. You know they I don't know if you are aware of this, but they purchased a um, esports a professional esports franchise to complement their other sports uh, franchises uh, uh, three years ago, and they were looking for uh, a partner to uh, create an e a gaming esports uh, type venue uh, on the property at, at uh, Patriot Place. So um, Brian Early and a team came down and saw our location down in, in North Bergen. Um, you know, again, as he said, we have a, a very good reputation. Uh, we have a great relationship with the town down there. We run one of the biggest high school leagues in the country um, that was uh, formed really, uh, the cornerstone team was the North Bergen High School, and we plan to do a, a very similar thing in, in, uh, in Foxborough with the high school here and then the local communities. Um, we cater to um, uh, 
and you know this is you know the challenge but I think we've done it very well we cater from you know from 12 year olds up to 50 year olds you know the esports and gaming is casual and at the same time somewhat competitive um, it's multi-generational so we'll have dads come in with their daughters you know who are eight or nine years old sometimes and playing you know roadblocks and little games like that where they're playing Call of Duty um, you know we have a, a very good staff down there um, Jack uh, and his brother Murphy who's sitting in the audience um, were, were the original founders and, and uh, operators of the business and Jack is now uh, moved, moved up here since December to um, to get Foxborough going and then train the staff and make sure that we run it as well as we run the the operation down there. Um, Jack, why don't you talk a little bit about what away from the day of an esports so you can, they understand what what you do all day long. Actually, well, thank you for having me as well. Um, I think my dad hit the nail on the head. He's a lot better at this than, uh, than he gives himself credit about explaining it. So uh, in terms of um, the entertainment approach, um, that's pretty spot on. Uh, in terms of what goes on there, um, uh, we treat it at times almost like a gym, usually Monday through Thursday. Um, people come there to um, train competitively, um, and although the food and beverage is a nice complement to it, we have a lot of people who do take this seriously. And um, there's, funny enough, a lot of money involved in it now um, in terms of uh, prize money and and so a lot of people do treat it like a sport um, so you see them kind of Monday through Thursday you'll see that and then on the weekends um, as my dad mentioned you'll see a lot of um, large groups birthday parties um, fathers sons and just families come in um, and participate in what we call quick play um, which is where you just pay by the hour um, play your favorite games uh, we have a prize vault um, similar and pretty much inspired by Chuck E. Cheese if anyone's had the for I've been fortunate enough to go to Chuck E. Cheese uh, I think I dragged my mom there about probably a hundred times when I was younger so um, that definitely stemmed from that uh, and then lastly we are introducing um, VR which is um, virtual reality uh, and we have um, all kinds of different racers um, escape rooms uh, interactive sports um, so it's it's definitely a new concept but it's growing fast and, and we're really happy to be here and um, happy to be back in Massachusetts and out in New York for now so better place to be <laughs> uh, I did pass around copies of the, the menu and also uh, blown up pictures of what the place looks like. Um, so you um, have a better idea of what we're talking about. Great. Um, since Lee is uh, virtual herself right now, uh, Lee, do you have any questions? We'll start with you. Oh, we can't oh, hear her. lost her. A little Sorry, technical. I'm, uh, oh, I'm good. Go. Thank oh, you. Oh, you hear us? Okay, you, okay, we can hear you good. now. We can hear you now. We can I'm hear you good, now. no questions. Oh, you're good with questions, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody on the board? No, I, I just, just want to say it's a fascinating concept. Um, be interested to see how, how well received it is. I know <clears throat> under the circumstances right now, everybody's <laughs> probably doing this in their, in their basements or at home. Um, but it'd be interesting to see if, if, if you know, kids and families get out and, and really, really take to this. And I know it's going to be a, another another thing at Patriot Place that differentiates to what's going on down there. So um, I think it's it's fascinating. Yeah. Now you, you and uh, Chris. Yeah, just a couple of questions on the application um, uh, number three under description of premises. The seating and, and everything that it talks about there is that seating for the restaurant. The, the bar, the food aspect, or is that the whole gaming? Thing, everything. Okay. That's including the gaming and including the outdoor thing. Okay. Are there separate areas? Like these are, are really cool looking, but it doesn't show any like, you know, yeah. tables for dining or anything. So is there a separate area outside of this? Yeah, if I, if I could elaborate a little bit, um, 23 Patriot Place is the old Showcase Live yeah. entertainment venue. And um, we, um, along with the um, professional esports franchise, the Boston Uprising, that the, the Kraft Sports Group owns, um, have repurposed the space, kept, I would say, about 80% of the footprint. We've opened it up a little bit, um, but we've kept some of the banquettes that will be used for dining. We've opened up the lobby area to have some dine, you know, to have some for takeout and uh, dining there. 
the big bar area is still um, we kept intact. Um, there will be uh, a separate area where you know the, the, for tables for 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 dining. But um, part of the um, the interest for this, and we 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 see it in in, in our location in, in in New Jersey, but also in a couple of other places that we've done some consulting for. Uh, these gamers will come out and they'll like to eat and drink at at their stations. Um, and with that comes a challenge for us because each one of these stations is about two thousand dollars worth of equipment. So we have to be very, very careful on on what's consumed there. So pizza and wings sometimes <laughs> isn't the best. Yeah. But because of that, we have, and, and I'll give Jack and his, his brother Murphy credit, we have an, an, an incredible protocol on cleanliness, wiping down stations, wiping down um, the headsets, you know, from a sanitary perspective, as we saw this all coming about publicly with, with COVID, it, you know, these are things that we do every day. And, but with that, um, we have our staff on the floor troubleshooting, wiping down. So as soon as you were to leave a station, someone's there kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, cleaning up, wiping down around you. But then, you know, if there's any crumbs, if there's certainly if there's any uh, drinks, whether it be a Gatorade bottle or Mountain Dew or, you know, anything else, it is disposed of immediately. Um, it's one of those, we get busy enough on sat Fridays and Saturdays, you know, move your feet lose your seat type of thing we take that pretty seriously when someone's you know vacates it, it it is it's clean wiped down and you know ready for for somebody else to to use it so you know back to your question about the physical space it's you know it's the showcase live we have some designated but part of the experience is to have you know having a slice of pizza and being able to game at the same time is part of the allure okay all right and then my only other question is more probably on your end, Bill, um, or maybe even Brian. So Showcase Live did have a liquor license. They did. And the, uh, they're applying for a new one, or they're applying, they're applying for, for that? They're applying for that license. That license, okay. Right. All right. Okay. Um, it looks gorgeous. Um, but I'll tell, thank you for the, uh, the footprint. That showed us a little bit more than, than the pictures. Yeah. Gave me a better idea. I've been here forever and never stepped foot in Showcase Live. Sorry, just I know. <laughs> never saw it then. Did see Peter Frampton there? <laughs> uh, so I'll definitely stop by and take a look at the footprint. Um, um, your experience with um, you're you're going to be the um, uh, liquor manager. Um, any experience, prior experience uh, uh, with that role? Um, I started with uh, opening Jersey in 2018 at uh, North Bergen, New Jersey, the Helix location there, um, and has been from, uh, I think it was November 2018 until now. Okay. So you were the manager down there? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. okay. And Dave, you're a uh, shtick right about now? Well, I don't, I don't <laughs> have to mention Fox Cares. <laughs> Brian, I'm sure, has already warned you about Fox Cares and, you know, the they're the biggest supporters of it, so I'm going to spare everybody my my lecture. And they, they've already uh, obviously Brian's talked to them, and they, they do a lot down in their community yep. and are very community oriented. So I think you'll see that um, very very happy with, with uh, how they how they approach Fox. So. How many how many employees do you think you'd be hiring up there? Probably 12 to 14 to start. I think is you know. We'll have to ramp that up when we have bigger events. And when I say bigger events, you know, we um, when the Boston Uprising, um, funny concept. When they play their game, when they play their their away games, um, we'll host watch parties for them. And you know, for that we could get two, three hundred people. And that's when we use the bleachers and things of that nature. Um, that's when the, the the crowd will get more adult oriented. Um, you know, we'll have to bring in you know AV specialists that we're going to try to use the local you know local people around here we're going to train a lot of uh, kids to do that as well um, so I would say probably 12 to 14 directly and then you know another uh, 10 to 12 from security to additional bartending to you know uh, special you know audio visual specialists yeah. top Good. of that Good. Yeah, do you have any no I'm all set 
Uh, this is a public hearing. <laughs> Anybody in the public <laughs> have any uh, comments? All right, I'll accept the motion to close the public hearing. A uh, motion to close the public hearing for Helix Foxpro LLC. Second. Any further discussion? Mm. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Good. Uh, motion to approve on-premises annual all alcohol restaurant license authorized by special legislation chapter 201 of the acts of 2007 the Helix Foxboro LLC doing business as Helix Esports at 23 Patriots Place, Foxboro, Mass, with the manager on record being John Vandevelt. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Welcome to Foxboro. Oh, one more. Oh. <laughs> Motion to Two approve more, yeah. a Come common on. vitular and seven day entertainment license for established hours of operation for Helix Foxboro LLC doing business as Helix Esports. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Now. Welcome to Fox. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Good luck. Good luck. Thank Good luck. you. To, uh, be well, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Best of luck to you all, all and be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Stay out of New Jersey. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> kidding. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. See you, Brian. Thank you. Thanks, you too. All right. Um, town elections and town meeting postponement discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good luck. Do you want to come up too, Frank? Yeah. Just uh, <laughs> way at the other end. <laughs> oh, <the window>? <laughs> <laughs> There's a door right there. <laughs> All right. Uh, Bill, you want to yeah, so lead in? Uh, I'll just sort of um, lead into this conversation. This is, I think tonight's going to be more of a discussion more than it is anything in terms of action for the board tonight because um, this, this is a situation that's sort of evolving uh, as we speak. And, um, and I'm going to defer to Bob, on, uh, Bob and, and to Frank on some of these items because um, uh, Bob has actually tracked this legislation a lot closer than I have. And, uh, and, and the legislation that is currently pending before the governor is supposed to be approved, I think, by tomorrow, from what I'm told. But, um, but that would, would actually help clarify the situation relative to the town meeting. Um, but there are two actions that we need, the board needs to consider tonight, or at least talk about tonight. And that is the fact that given the circumstances with COVID-19, uh, many cities and towns across the Commonwealth are actually moving their elections and their town meetings to later dates than what is normally uh, listed in their town bylaws and charters. So as, as we currently s speak, um, there is a, the, the, the election date is set for May 4th, and the, uh, and the town meeting is set for May, 7, May 11th. And at this time, um, it's our belief that those dates will not jive with what's currently going on, and that it's probably, it makes good sense for us to consider moving those dates. So um, we did have a conversation with town council about this, and, and town council, I think, also spoke with Frank uh, about this earlier tonight. And um, the general consensus was that we uh, probably should wait until the legislation is actually approved. It will help provide, help provide a little bit more, more uh, clarity as to how we should act as a town. Uh, the Board of, Board of Selectmen has, has some authority here because um, based upon what the legislative action has, 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 has uh, provided for the cities and towns is that selectmen have the ability to actually move the date for the election. It's not 100% clear as to how that's going to work with the town meeting yet, but we think it's going to end up with the selectmen uh, taking a further action there as well. So um, that's sort of like the introduction to where we are and why we're here tonight before you on this conversation. But um, I'll, I'll defer to uh, my, my friends and colleagues at the table here to see what they would like to do and uh, if they can add anything more to that. So um, as you probably know, the town election and the town meeting are called on one warrant. So when that's posted, it covers both of those items. Um, so. There already was a bill passed and signed by the governor on March 23rd that allows you or the Board of Registrars to reschedule the election. There's a bill that's pending. Uh, I was expecting that it was going to be voted on yesterday to allow you to also um, move the town meeting. 
that hasn't been passed yet. And as mm -hmm. uh, Bill mentioned that, um, it's expected any day. And we, we're constantly checking it because obviously my, uh, May 4th and May 11th don't look realistic at this date, especially when schools are just gonna be back at May 4th if that happens. Um, so you already have the authority uh, by that bill to move the election. I think the election should be moved for a number of reasons, uh, uh, most of which um, most of my election workers are elderly and I wouldn't want to put them at risk. Um, so I'd have to come up with a different game plan to staff the election. Um, one of the other things we need to think about, and I don't think we can decide tonight, uh, the election typically runs from 7 in the morning to 8 o'clock at night. We're only required by law to go from like noon to uh, 7 o'clock at night. We've always gone the extended time, um, but a lot of chatter in the uh, town clerk world is everybody's going to short, shortened election hours uh, because we're hoping that um, many of the people who are going to vote will take advantage of absentee rules. Those were expanded for um, this election. Uh, typically, they'd have to have th one of three reasons to vote absentee, but because of the pandemic, they've made that uh, an additional reason. So I would be really promoting absentee voting in this election anyways. Um, they also added, uh, which was not in uh, the handout that you received, uh, early voting for, for this election, which is not allowed in typically in municipal elections. But essentially, there's very little difference between that and absentee, and I'm just really promoting more of the absentee than the early voting. Um, you know, all of that would be done by mail. Um, typically, I'd be ordering ballots um, Thursday. I already sent it into the uh, printing company um, the last day to withdraw for our election, for this spring election, is tomorrow. Uh, and after that, I would order the ballots. So I'm going to order them anyways. I'm going to order additional absentee ballots. Um, and I, I just don't see us having an election on May 4th. Um, with regard, I, I, I'm thinking that, and I've talked to Frank about this, that we should try to keep the election uh, and the town meeting the same break, the, the, the week in between, and try to keep them on the same day, a Monday. We picked a couple of dates, we talked to Bill Eupner. Um I don't know that we need to set the dates now, or just for discussion purposes, but I think we're gonna to have to have an additional meeting and vote at a later date, even if we were to change the dates tonight, just because we're gonna see in a couple of weeks, three weeks, how things progress. So um, I, I don't know if you want to add anything on the town meeting, Frank, or- uh, Frank, before you start on town meeting, I just want to, anybody on the board have any questions on, on elections first? Um, I'll, I'll go with Leah. Leah, do you have any questions on what uh, Bob has been telling us? No, it sounds like it's still a pretty fluid situation. Okay. Yeah, my only thing, like looking at a calendar, and, and I 100% agree, the May 4th date needs to get moved. Um, Typically, if, if you're a candidate running for a, a position, you kind of have about seven weeks. Um, so if we're going to move it, I would like to kind of keep that thought. And I don't know what dates you guys are thinking, but give potential new candidates at least the same time frame. Because they, I guess they could put signs out, but they can't, you know, stand at the common with a group of people. They can't, you know, go on cable, like, probably. So um, I think we need to afford them the same opportunity um, as a regular election. And then my only other question, it partially has to do with election and town meeting. Um, I know we've always done it a week apart. Do we have to do it a week apart? And like with the election, everything I read, it has to be done by June 30th. Does town meeting also have to be concluded by June 30th? Those are just my off the top questions as far as them being a week apart no we don't have to under the current circumstances the reason i was trying to do that was to take advantage of a, a single warrant posting and a single voter registration yep. um, if we were to separate them 
more than that week, then we'd have to do probably separate warrants and separate voter registrations. Again, not big problems, but it's just trying to make it more convenient. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just, we need to kind of look at all options. And then the other thing, does the town meeting have to happen after the election? I know we do, you know, vote them, but could it, could the town meeting happen, you know, the week before the election if we run into a situation like that? Um, I would say it should go in the same order if we can do it. And <clears throat> the reason why I say that is the very first article on the warrant is always confirming the vote at town meeting. Yeah. Um, so I, I would imagine, because I did read um, an email from a clerk today where they are actually switching their rotation. So yeah. I, I would think technically it could probably happen, but I, I think for ease and convenience, it yeah. would be yeah. better to keep them the same. But Frank, you had a thought? Um, technically, under our bylaws, town meeting begins the first Monday in May, which is the town election, and is continued to the second Monday in May at 7.30 for the town meeting. So technically, town meeting starts with the election, and that's the way it's set up. Now, I have to assume, under these unusual circumstances, whatever is in the best interest of the town and the town government and the town uh, members and residents, I think we'd be able to figure out a way to do it. Uh, yeah. But that's the way uh, the bylaw sets it out to be. Yeah. I think we see when that bill is passed, because I absolutely expect it to be passed and the governor signs it, the bill on the town meetings, that will also give us some more clarity on, on these issues. Um, Dave, Ed, do you have any uh, thoughts? Well, I think given uh, the era that we're in right now to postpone the election and the town meeting, I think it would be in the best interest for the total community. Right, Frank, you want to talk a little bit about town meeting too, or? I, I think or was that uh, it? Bob <laughs> pretty much co covered everything. Um, I've been in, in constant contact with Bob, Bill, and I've talked with town council um, today um, about it. You know, there are different ways we can um, uh, postpone or continue town meeting. Um, I have the authority uh, as the moderator uh, with regard to public safety to continue it, and that's up to 30 days. And our understanding is I could do it more than once if necessary. But we're also looking at legislation that possibly would give the Board of Selectmen and under statute now the ability to um, move it forward also. Um, so I think, you know, talking with um, Bob and Bill, we're all in agreement that it should be moved. Um, we want to make sure the dates didn't conflict with anything, not that anything is going on now. And uh, But also one of my concerns was I want to make sure that we had a second night, uh, even though I'm sure the warrant's going to be um, slimmed down uh, to a great extent. I think um, uh, the public uh, the town meeting members will have a lot of questions with regard to what's occurring to the, the um, current fiscal year with regard to revenues, et cetera, and how that's going to affect next year's as well as, you know, revenue for next year. Um, because as we all know, revenue for both the state and the town are going to be down. And uh, how are we going to deal with it? So I think that I, I would anticipate a lot of questions from town meeting members, because it's also going to be a little bit hard to get a lot of information out to people too. So you know, I've asked to make sure that we have an open date after that um, initial uh, date that we uh, talked about in case we have to continue it. And also in the event that um, we can't have it on that Monday for another reason. One of the things that isn't in the legislation, I don't think Bob touched on is the ability of towns to um, continue town meetings until July. Technically under the uh, state statute, you have to have your budgets approved by June 30th because uh, fiscal year starts July 1st. Uh, but in the legislation that hasn't been passed yet, there is uh, um, some items in there that allows towns to, if they can't for whatever reason, get town meeting to approve or town council or whomever to approve the budget until uh, the next fiscal year where the town can continue to you know, operate. There's mechanisms in there for that. Uh, so they're trying to look at all different possibilities 
so that they just have to pass these uh, uh, bills once and think it all through. So okay. there's a lot of options what, there. The one thing I will say with the uh, election is that uh, when we do pick a new date, it's got to be at least 20 days before the new date. The vote has to be at least 20 days before the, the new date. So we can't let it run deep into May because then we'll be pushing up against that 20 day period. Yeah. Good chance, hopefully by next meeting, two weeks, we should have a better idea of what direction we need to go in. Do we um, want to talk about potential dates right now, or you want to keep that I think that would be off good to let the public know what we're thinking at this point. Please yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. so we, we uh, talked uh, initially about June 8th as the election date, and June 15th as the town meeting date, both Mondays, to try to keep on that same yeah. schedule. Um, again, it doesn't have to be on the same days, Mondays, but just trying to be consistent. Um, and then I think we were looking at an overflow date. And the reason why we went that early in June was in case we needed an additional night for the town meeting, uh, we'd have some, you know, two weeks before the 30th to get that scheduled to try to stay within the statutory June 30th date. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and obviously when you've talked to those dates, those dates seem pretty clear. Uh, yes. Yeah, we've, we've, uh, talked, we've talked at length about what, the, what that all means. Um, you know, conceivably, you could actually go right up until the, I think the 29th if we had to uh, for another, another date, you know, another Monday if we had to. Or you could go consecutive nights if you needed to as another option. Uh, there's no set method or, or, or procedure for necessarily going, you know, for how you want to continue. I mean, there is a process for the town meeting to, to have to continue it, but it has to be for a date certain. And so I think that's the, the and we were talking about doing it a, a week later, particularly um, as Frank points out that, you know, there'll be some questions about our revenue situation, our budgets and the budgets. And, and, um, and you know, a lot of us in, in this municipal world right now are looking at, you know, how are we going to deal with this? And uh, there are different, different schools of thought about how to approach it. But, um, you know, I think um, that we, you know, heading into this process, we actually used a pretty conservative approach anyways. So I think we're in a better position to address it than others. But having said that, you know, if it continues to go on for several months, it's going gonna, it's gonna to impact everybody, and then we're all going to be in the same position asking the same questions. So I think with due respect to the, the debate on the budget, that will, that will be the, the, probably the big discussion point that we'll have to get through. And, and of course, capital plans, things of that nature. Anything that with a financial mechanism will, will also require a little bit more discussion, and, and certainly we'll be prepared, prepared to do that. But the, um, but I think, and if we were going to do it, I was asking, I suggested that maybe we wait another week in between meetings, so that would give us more time to prepare more information for folks, so that we would be able to be better respond to questions if they did come up. So that um, it's hard to do that, give information on something if you're going to have to meet the next very next night. So it's, um, I would think we want to be in a better position to prepare if we, if we did that. The only thing we have to keep in mind is the later we go in June, as Frank and I have talked about, we have a quorum of 100 people. Right. And we know sometimes it can be difficult to get people to come out right. to town meetings. So we don't want to push it up to the last minute and then not have a quorum. Then we really would be in a, right. a pickle. Yeah, so those dates give us some wiggle room. They, yes. they do. Yeah. Good. They do. What is um, ADCOM's plan like going forward? Are they well, meeting at all? They, they haven't met uh, in the past few weeks. I did talk, have a conversation with Seth, uh, the chairman, this, this afternoon, um, indicating that we we're going to have this conversation tonight about setting the date, looking towards setting the date. And um, he said, look, we're ready to meet whenever we have to. And... Um, and we've talked about, you know, how that could, how that would look, and what the process would be dealing with that. Um, again, it was it was more of a just a first discussion, but we're going to have a further discussion again this week uh, about how we how we could proceed forward, because um, clearly there's still business before the board and the and the, and the adcom. Uh, we still have the capital plan to deal with, as well as we have the uh, some uh, several articles that haven't been presented yet. Uh, I think they were getting close to finishing up the budget process, but um, I think we'll we'll. You know, we still have a few things that we need to, need to want to talk about. Should our first action be um, the motion that we have in front of us to postpone, and then we won't vote on a date? I think it'll take it all in one all in one meeting. I think it, okay. I, my my thought would be that you just at least I, and I'll defer to both the gentlemen at the table. But 
I think you'd want to take it in one night and just uh, okay. say. And then you said, we, I would think, think if you're going to postpone it, but post, post, postpone it to a date certain gotcha. so that everybody understands that. Do you agree with that, Bob? I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, I, I would think hopefully maybe the next meeting in a couple right. weeks we'd have a lot more clarity on some right. of the questions that we still have. Um, hopefully that town meeting bill would have been passed and you know we'll, we'll have as many answers as we're going to get by then. Okay. So you're, you're okay, Frank, with just doing both at the same time in two weeks, if we can? Yes. I mean, okay. the town meeting, um, I would hold off on tonight at least, wait until that bill is passed. Okay. The election bill has passed, uh, so that's entirely up to the board yeah. whether they want to deal with that tonight or both. To Everybody comfortable with waiting two weeks? Yeah, I mean, yes. we all know we're postponing right. both, so um, it's just a matter of postponing it to a date once we do it yeah. and I think that message alone is important that the public should hear that yeah, yeah I've been you know, letting the candidates know because they're all obviously concerned about what's going to happen and I've already told them that we were going to be having this meeting tonight I will tell them tomorrow uh, that the intention is there to be a, a po postponement with possible dates in the beginning of June so yeah. Yeah. They'll, they'll at least on board with what's going on okay Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I just have a question with regard to the warrant itself. Um, how many articles do you anticipate? And are you slimming it down to 16? what it was before? Well, we, we, that number's probably going to be lower now. I think we're looking at about 13 articles at this point. 13 or 14, Mike? Is that the last That's thing? Correct. Okay, so we had actually anticipated uh, we had three contracts that were supposed to be on the warrant, but we've taken those off now because we're going to have to take them off because it, there's just no way we're going to get them done. Uh, this, given the circumstances. Okay. Yeah, so there's three. So there was 16, so down to 13. 13. Yeah, 13. <laughs> That's great. And most of those are the Just usual. Routine. Yeah, routine ones. Right, yeah. dotting yeah. I's and crossing T's. Yeah. The biggest one will be the budget. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. All right, great. Thank you very much. We'll see yeah. you guys in a couple of weeks. Great. Um, COVID-19 state of emergency labor policy review and possible vote. So I've sent to you, item. did I miss something? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Item five. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, change of official posting location for open meetings for the town of Foxborough. Sorry about that. So, um, so this is a, another item that uh, relates to COVID-19, but it's, it's something that um, the board at one point took this matter up. Um, it was probably about four or five years ago, Bob, if I'm I not mistaken. it was when we first moved into yeah. the building. So, yeah, so it was a, a couple of years, uh, almost three years ago. Three years ago. So the, the issue is that the, 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 the law now allows you to determine wh it, what is your official posting location. Is it, in fact, a board inside, located inside the building, or, can you, or do you want to make it the website? And there was still a little bit of debate that circulated uh, at that time, and, and the town opted... The board opted not at that point not to make that the official website. But, but given the way the world has evolved in the past several years and what's happening right now, that is really the, probably the best way to do that. Now, the, the, the point that was debated at the time was that some people may not have computers, but, you know, but I think that's probably, um, that's probably less of a case now, and most people have access to a computer if they don't have a computer. Um, and then also was the fact that if, in fact, we have had a power outage, that would be potentially be an issue, but this building is actually on, on the constant power. Uh, we have a backup generator in the building, <clears throat> so that's less of an issue now than it was uh, than it was before. Um, further from that is that um, <clears throat> our network system is actually duplicated throughout the town. So if, if so we had a breakdown in the system um, in one area, it would actually go to a second area and then reboot itself. So we we would have the ability to continue the, the system up and running. But, uh, but, but by and large, um, it's our thought that, you know, that given the circumstances that this is something that the board should really think about because right now we're technically out of compliance um, because we don't have uh, access to the building right now uh, because of, of the way the situation is. And short of that, the, the only alternative would, would be to locate some sort of a screen inside a window um, that, might be, that, that would actually show the meetings and how they're posted. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So we still we need time to do that and develop that and make that happen, but at least for the time being, I think an, an, an action by the board would be in order to, 
to make the, the website the official posting site. And uh, Bob, do you have anything else you want to add to that? I think this <clears throat> came about because the uh, <clears throat> Attorney General's office kind of recommended that at least on a temporary basis this be done because most t uh, town buildings are closed to the public. So um, they sent out a guidance uh, to Christina and we talked about it and that they're kind of recommending that you do this at least temporarily. And for the future, we would have to come up with a different um, posting board that was visible to the public all the time. So it, it almost makes sense at this time to just do it permanently. Yeah. So that would be my recommendation. Okay. Uh, any questions from the board, Leah? Uh, nope, I'm one to go with the Attorney General's guidance. So if that's <laughs> what they're recommending, I support it. Yeah, and I think it makes sense to do it and do it permanently in this day and age. You know, it back in the old town hall, it made sense. Everybody walked in and that was like one of the first things everybody saw was the boards, you know, but now you know, they'd have to walk in and I'll go down to your <clears throat> area of the building. So um, I think it makes sense to have it on the website as the official place. Digital world. Okay. Digital world is right. <clears throat> All right, and so good idea to just vote on it now and- uh, I, I would hope that you would, yes. Yeah, yeah, there's a um, motion to you. Uh, motion to approve the town website as the official notice posting method in accordance with the Code of Massachusetts Regulation 940, Section 29.03. Second. Any further discussion? Yeah, under discussion, does that permanently use our website, or is that code just a temporary? So, the, so that uh, code is the, their permanent code? Okay. They just sent out the guidance. Okay. Uh, the, the posting still comes to our office, gets time stamped, put on the website, but it's still going to be on the board there as a secondary. Okay. Anybody that wants to come in and look at the board, it's still going to be there. Okay. Okay. All those in favor? All right. All right. Opposed? None? Great. Thanks again, right. Bob. Thanks, Bob. Be well. <laughs> you too. That's the plan, right? <laughs> uh, number six. Now that I've... So at Back. your last meeting, you, um, you voted on and, and approved side letters for our, uh, our five uni unions, uh, six letters because one of the unions has two units in it. Um, and that was giving some flexibility to the use of, um, of leave, sick leave in, in, uh, you know, in the light of the pandemic. Um, and that was to get us started, and that was really just a starting point. Um, since then, we've been in constant contact with our labor attorney and our HR attorney, who uh, both recommend that we take up some policies to, um, to, to further specify how we're going to handle things during this. And the, so the four policies that you have in front of you are remote work and telecommuting policy, an emergency reassignment of duties policy, a return to work protocol during um, you know, COVID-19 emergency, and emergency modification to the sick leave policy, um, which follows the, the side letters you know, that you took up two weeks ago, but also follows the newly adopted um, Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act, or FFCRA. So, um, you know, Friday, you had these posted to board docs. Um, late this afternoon, I sent them back to you again with a couple of uh, highlights. Um, and those highlights and changes are reflective of conversations with the, uh, the personnel board meeting last night, as well as further conversations with our HR attorney and, and labor attorney, um, in addition to um, ongoing operational discussions with our, um, our health director, our board of health, our, um, community, our public health nurse, and, um, and our you know, operations uh, response team here. So um, that's why there are a couple of changes from what you, what you saw Friday. So I would entertain any questions that you might have 
um, in regards to this. Uh, one other note, these policies did go out to all the unions and, um, and will also apply to all non-union personnel. Um, so they'll be you know, equally uh, you know, uh, applied. So uh, the personnel board did vote unanimously to support these policies. These policies would be signed by the town manager. So what I'm looking for is uh, support from the board of selectmen um, as well uh, to en endorse these. The other thing that our, um, that our council has suggested is that we, um, we take these up sooner rather than later. And if there are modifications uh, because of the fluid environment that, that we're currently in, that we you know take it up in a week or two if we need to make any adjustments. I mean, in here, one of the adjustments, as you see, is, is new research that's come out uh, from the CDC um, uh, in, in regards to return to work policy and return to work protocols and what needs to be done. Um, so, so this could evolve. But um, what's important to note is that it, it's, it's probably better that you take a look at these if you, if you agree with these um, as a whole, that, um, that I would encourage you to discuss them tonight and, um, and you know, give your support to these so that we can start you know, um, acting on them. And then um, happy to um, you know, take up any, any uh, concerns that you might have or questions or additions you might have. The, the personnel board did have a couple of um, uh, very good questions and some things that we needed to take up with uh, labor and HR attorney. And, um, and I'm here to answer those questions or bring other concerns back to our, our council that you might have. Any questions from the board? I just find it amazing that you come before us with these, with, with the fluidity of what's going on, uh, with so much changing and so much uh, almost day to day, different directions that this is all going, that you're able to put a, these policies together for us to try to keep as updated as possible. Um, I think you're just doing an outstanding job. If I was able to bring this to you alone, uh, it would be incredible. <laughs> um, and if I was to take credit for that, um, that would be dis disingenuous. So uh, there's been a large team working on these, and, um, and, and we started from templates from our, from our labor attorney. And then uh, we did gather here uh, first thing yesterday morning with our COVID-19 uh, task force team. And as I mentioned, you know, our you know, uh, Board of Health is, and our health director are involved in that. Of course, the town manager, manager myself, and department heads across the town. So this is, uh, this is a team effort. Mr. Chairman, I, I did have a conversation with Leah about some of these policies this afternoon, and um, she raised a really good point that, you know, some of these policies, while they're, they're specific to these moments right now, which I think they should be approved in their current order, uh, these are policies that we will want to modify later on to become more general policies in some cases based on the fact that whenever, and, and, and they will be triggered by whenever the town actually uh, calls for an, uh, another state of emergency, that type of thing, we could actually modify some of these policies to come into play on a more general way. Um, yeah, this is, I mean, these are extraordinary uh, policies, extraordinary times, and as a result, um, a lot of people have, have, have had to bring a lot of uh, resources to the table to address these things in a quick and, and orderly way. Um, but uh, I, I think Mike's being a little bit modest. I mean, he, he really sort of took the point on this and, and handled a lot of these things, and I, I'm really grateful for his work on this. Um, but, you know, this, this is not easy to pull these things together. And also it requires a lot of work with the unions to get their buy-in to these policies and work with us on this. And they've been very, very cooperative as well, and uh, I'm grateful for their efforts to make this all work in, 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 a, in an orderly way as well. So, um, yeah, this is, this is really important things that we have to deal with right now, but, um, but it's also something that we um, will see as, as the world evolves beyond COVID-19 as to how the world will work, and this is something that we'll, we'll take with us when we do that. Uh, any thoughts? I did have a couple of questions. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yes. 
So, you know, kind of echoing what Bill just said, with any kind of business continuity planning, you never see it coming. So, you know, I will obviously approve these as they are, but we haven't had much time to digest some of the, the changes. So we're kind of rubber stamping them, I think. Um, but for the remote work policy, like that's one I think we can make generic. It doesn't have to be related to COVID. You know, you need these policies when you don't have time to plan. So if we're doing this now by just having a remote work policy, we have it for whenever the next, you know, hopefully we don't have another one, but, you know, disaster occurs that we need to act quickly. Um, and then the other two questions I had, Mike, they may be more related to state stuff than towns, but um, the first one I saw, you know, we hear so much about how hard it is to get tested. And for the return to work policy, it states that people need to have two negative swab tests in order to return to work. Is that actually happening? And will that um, kind of stand in the way of people being able to return to work? If it's hard enough to get tested, are they gonna be able to be tested again after they've had a negative test in order to return according to this policy? I'm really glad you asked that question because it's important to, um, you know, to talk about that one a little bit. Let me get back to it. Um, and this, is, this was one of the most fluid areas um, up until just before this meeting, I was in um, communication with our, um, our director of, of public health and our public health nurse, who's our, you know, uh, one of our deputy fire chiefs, and, um, and pulling from them, as well as the, the research that uh, Mass Department of Public Health and the, and the CDC are, are um, you know, are the, the information they're using. And so there are actually two ways or two strategies that this can be approached from and that is because people are realizing the logistical nightmare that this has caused so one is getting the tests into the state and then into the community the test kits but then there's also the equipment to apply the tests and then there's the people um, to to do the procedure and we know right now as we're watching the the health care um, system that that could be one of the critical areas, uh, one of the, one of the most crucial areas that that is going to you know make it or break us as far as you know being able to sustain that, you know not have that critical mass go over the ability of our of our uh, public health uh, system to, to sustain us. Um, so one of the the first strategy that they that the CDC proposes for people to come out of isolation. Um, or quarantine is a non-test strategy. So this, this applies to someone whether they tested positive initially for COVID-19 or they did not test but were clinically diagnosed by the symptomology. Um, they can actually come out of quarantine or isolation uh, with a non-test strategy. And that um, that involves three basic things. So they can come out of, of isolation and back to work by having um, zero, zero fever or no fever for 72 hours, three days, and improved symptomology, which means decreased respiratory systems and decreased cough. And, and they don't, CDC is not saying zero, but they're saying to be non-contagious, um, decreased symptomology and seven days since the first start of their symptoms. So that is uh, one way that people can get back to work. And um, you know, I had talked with the fire department and, and the police chief, um, who's, who's very concerned if, you know, if, if we don't have the supplies or the test kits to be able to do that, and he can't bring his people back, even though they're symptom free and, and probably non-contagious, um, he's concerned that he may not have a police force if it spreads to that degree. So I really appreciate that question because it, it does, um, you know, it, that is one of the things that is, has changed since you first saw this policy on Friday. So that's, that's one strategy is the non-test strategy. And the, the, the second strategy is the one that you already saw, which is the test-based strategy, which is consisting of two negative swabs at least 24 hours apart and um, and the reduced fever 
um, and improvement of the cough, cough and respiratory symptoms. So uh, very good question and I'm happy to report that we do have a, a second way to address that to uh, get people out of quarantine as well as back to work. So do we feel like that's clear? Because when I look at section two, when I look at section one, I understand that. You know, if I am just clinically diagnosed positive, I understand it would be section one. However, if I test positively, I read the policy, you then go to, to section two. I don't read it to be either or of those. So again, not going to stop the policy tonight, but it looks a little gray to me under that. Like I didn't understand it. Um, so that is on the updated return to work section two numbers one or two, I think it should say one, you know, one, one or the other. it says one of the two now, but it's not really clear to me that it can be both. I thought that it was, you know, strategy one is if you were just clinically diagnosed, strategy two is what you have to follow if you were actually tested. So if you're saying, if I test positive, I can still use strategy one to return to work. That's and correct. Like that's clear. And, and that was um, that was made clear over the last couple of days in, um, you know, in, in talking with uh, attorneys and with um, consultation with CDC and um, Mass Department okay. of Public Health. and. On the attachment A that I that I put with that policy is the the verbatim terminology coming from the CDC that um, that this is based on, and this is based on on uh, you know recent research. So it is you know, you know one one or the other. It doesn't have to be both. So okay. I'm, I'm willing to bet you you'll get an update from the CDC a week from now that'll be slightly different than than what you're. I Same agree. Right now. Yeah. Yep, I agree, and that's why I think we need to remain ready to to come back and readdress this. And it, it might be that um, you know I'm looking for support as we as we make a change to one section of or two sections of a couple of these policies. Absolutely, this is going to be fluid over the next you know, four to eight weeks, so we we could be revisiting these. The key the key there is that the technology is changing right before our eyes. I, I, the, the timing that when we first started this out, it was uh, 7 to 14 days for a test result. Now it's down to 48 hours and sometimes less than that. So it's, I'm, thinking, I'm hearing that it could be done within hours now within, within a doctor's office. And supposedly Abbott's coming out with a, with a test that you can get a result in 15 minutes. Right. So There's think. another key point that's driving some of this in, in the research is that um, there are false positives. And false positive results from these tests are a real problem. And the, the quick result tests, um, I'm told by a reliable source that those, um, while they, they're very convenient um, and they, they, they really help to get the results uh, going, that they can result in more false positives. And um, that's another reason to, you know, to, to have the, you know, the, the non-test method methods. coming out of, because somebody might have gone, uh, had a false positive and now you can't have them back to week and you know b until you get the test kits and the supplies and the people to apply it so that's part of what's driving this most recent change so maybe i'm oversimplifying it but you know do we need to have a policy this specific or can we just follow the cdc guidelines and kind of have that i mean what's what's the benefit to being this specific and not just saying following the cdc guidelines and letting this kind of ebb and flow as it happens I think we have to document the CDC guidelines as much as we can in our policy, correct? No, I, th I think what, what Lee is suggesting that, that since the, since the, gu the guidelines are changing, that, we'll, we'll, that, we, uh, that employees can return to work based upon whatever the CDC guidelines right. provide. Right, right. so that's don't simple. pull it out and spell yeah, it out simple. because that may change tomorrow. Instead, right. I would suggest the policy just say in accordance to CDC guidelines. Right. So what we could do is, is you know, the three sections here, purpose, procedure, and reporting, uh, we could keep the, the purpose for the most part, um, change the procedure, put the CDC website on there, we're going to follow these procedures, and then, um, and then three, reporting. I think the section one and three are important to keep in there, and, you know, why we're why we're uh, doing this, and three is really important because it, it's, it you know, says, Who's going to be who's going to be reported to, and needs to be right. reported to someone central, and that's going to be the hu human resources department. But I agree with you. We could we've done that in other policies. Um, in fact, in the past, we were looking at adopting a um, 
you know, Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, ADA uh, uh, policy to, to, to in accordance with the ADA Act. And uh, we had advice that, you know, we're, we're better off to just go with the, uh, with the uh, ADA guidelines. But we are being advised by our labor attorney that we should take up a policy. But I'm perfectly happy to make Section 2, you know, the website, and we'll follow these guidelines, and then we may not have to revisit it as often. So an idea on that, why wouldn't you put procedure as of 331 2020 subject to change per CDC updates or something? Because I read both of these, like, it totally makes sense to me. I understand it um, for, you know, positive and you had all the symptoms, but you tested negative. So uh, I would just recommend we just put procedure as of today's date and then. Or yeah. as amended. Yeah. Or as amended. Yeah. Or revised. Yeah. That's my suggestion. And then the, the last line in that policy uh, does say any changes to these cr criteria or protocol in general shall be communicated to the affected employees. So we're going to let people know, you know, uh, as you know, if we change this policy or as those guys, because because they need to know. Now, you know, who's who's monitoring this? Is it you? Is it the the deputy uh, fire chief, board of health, like for updates? So the the um, we're actually working as a team on that. Um, That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so as far as tracking the, the um, positives, whether they're positive test results or, or positive clinical diagnosis, those are being tracked by our public health nurse, the deputy chief, yeah. um, you know, along with our, our health director. But we're working with them to follow any changes. So, for example, there were, there were three um, um, webinars, uh, not webinars, but um, uh, basically uh, Zoom yeah. uh, meetings today that, that our, you know, that our health director and our public health nurse were involved in and, and they had to each be at different ones because they were, they were carrying really important stuff from CDC and Mass yeah. Department of Public Health. Okay. So it's really fluid. <laughs> and and that's, that's the nature of this is that as, as more people are are um, exposed. There's more data, and you know, and it and it does change. This this um, the, the, and the reason it's tough to chase down a uh, vaccine for this is because this this virus is is changing, you know, as as time goes on. So the data is changing, and our procedures was, will definitely change. As is the as legal needed. legal guidance in this. That's yeah. evolving too. There there are things here that the attorneys don't even know how it's going to go, and there's things here we none of us have ever dealt with before. So we're it's evolving as we speak. So um, you would like us to approve? Yes. The, 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 okay. Any other questions before um, we? Uh, I would say as amended, though, right? As amended. Yeah, I did have one other comment. Sorry, I hate to hold you guys up. But um, in relation to when someone's out, I saw it somewhere in the policy that they have to tell their supervisor if it's COVID-19 related and then how it relates. Do we have any concerns with them reporting that into a supervisor and not into HR for confidentiality purposes? It leaves some interpretation up to the supervisor for what level of detail they get into, um, making sure they understand that it's just the classification if they're out for themselves to care for someone else. Um, that just looked like something to me that looked a little bit open, but if attorneys are comfortable with it, I'm good with it. Um, yeah, the attorneys uh, did you know, did uh, put this language. Um, I will, you know, that, that's worth asking the question. I mean, if we're, if we're into any HIPAA stuff, um, you know, that should be coming just to HR and not to other supervisors, you know, um, I'll certainly verify that. Uh, or maybe, maybe Mike, it's just a, a trader training or a note to the supervisors, exactly what we need so that they're not kind of getting into gory detail. Um, you know, it's just that, that one sentence in there just, you know, stuck out to me. Okay, makes sense. All right, I'll accept a motion to approve. Uh, so we're gonna have actually four motions. Can we do it all in one? Or just read could, the four and then we'll make a vote on it. Yeah, I would, I would take them one at a time, Ed. Oh, you, you would? Yeah, I would. Okay. Motion to accept 
emergency modification to the sick leave policy as proposed and potentially amended. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Motion to accept the remote work and telecommuting policy during the coronavirus emergency 2020 as proposed and could be amended. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Motion to accept the return to work protocol during the coronavirus slash COVID-19 emergency as proposed and potentially amended. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Motion to accept the emergency reassignment of duties policy pursuant to the declaration of emergency adopted March 24th, 2020 as proposed and possibly amended. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your input too, Leah. Yeah. Good work on this, everybody. Yeah. Uh, you're up again. Assistant Town Manager's report. Okay. Uh, just a couple of things to update. Um, if, um, if you were here yesterday morning, um, and if you'd ever seen, you know, uh, generals around the, around the table preparing for war, that's what this room looked like, because this truly is a war effort. And, and we had the, the commanders around here, the, the chiefs, the DPW director, the health director, we had uh, the, the chairman of the Board of Health, uh, zoomed in on, on the, the television there, you know, myself, the town manager, um, our, our community information specialist was here. Um, I'm sure I'm missing one or two, but um, I think we had nine here. And it was, it was addressing what are we doing right now this week to address this, this war effort. This is a war on a virus that's affecting our community, community just as it's affecting the rest of America and the world. And, and we're putting our best foot effort, uh, our best foot forward to address this in the best way we can as the, as the uh, situation changes. Um, you can be very proud of the leaders that you have, the department heads, um, but, I, but I have to say, um, I've been around uh, town and, and as the weeks go by, I'm getting further and fur further from people who are at at least six feet now, but um, I've been to every department um, we're in contact with people. Your town employees are doing an amazing job. They are going above and beyond. Uh, many are working um, in the regular workstation, out on the street doing their thing. Some are working remotely, and they are putting forth um, a yeoman's effort. And I'm very proud of them, as you should be too. Um, you're not going to see much of an interruption in services other than you can't get in some of the buildings. That's so that um, we're not further infecting the public um, as well as our employees because we want those services to continue. Uh, while there are some, is some level of reduced services as far as people can't check out books or go into the, the chair yoga at, at the Council on Aging, things like that, those things are going to um, pick right up as soon as we can. And so we have those folks working to, to keep those programs planned and going. Um, and, and I'm just so proud of the workforce that we have here. Um, and I just want to say thank you to the folks that are continuing to provide uh, the services to the, to the people of Foxborough. They're, they're doing a tremendous job. Um, one last thing I want to announce is that, that we uh, found out today that we are the recipients of a uh, Maya wellness grant. It's an $18,000 uh, grant, which uh, originally we, what we were applying for was a, a leadership training grant uh, that would involve all of our department heads. And with what has recently happened and our, our new need to, to meet remotely, uh, the folks who are doing this training um, are actually changing the format in the, the grant itself is called it's called go live and it's going to provide leadership training teamwork training so it's not just going to be department heads it's going to be supervisors and other team members as well and it's going to be uh, based on emergency remote safe continuity of services so they're going to be going to different groups of employees and they're going to be helping us to do zoom conferences and to find other ways to meet and work as a team remotely keep us connected in a time of disconnection 
and help us to work uh, more efficiently, more effectively, and I think we're going to come out of this uh, not only during this emergency better, but afterwards I think we're going to be a more, um, more efficient, effective organization to better serve the community. And that's all I have. Great. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mike, for, for that report. That was, uh, and I, I second everything that Mike has just said about our employees. I think I, um, you know, it, it, it takes, this is a time when, when folks uh, need to, to, be, to know that we're there for them, and it's also a time when I think our community recognizes the support that they're getting as well, and I, I really want to thank all the, the, the staff members and, and everybody who's been participating in this effort to try and keep the town running in a difficult and challenging time. Um, so the, just operationally, the, you know, the way we've been we've been forming, uh, the way we've been developing our team operations is that is that Mike has been in charge with dealing with day-to-day -day operations in terms of that includes employees and operational side. Um, I've been working with with the, the other branches of government, state and federal government, as well as uh, doing the messaging and, and working with the Board of Health and um, working with that team in, in the fire department directly with the police department to to make sure on the public safety side that we're doing all the things we can possibly do for the community and uh, preparing as necessary for those types of th types of things. Uh, the meeting yesterday was actually a great meeting. We're going to continue to meet on a, every Monday morning until the event is over, um, and it will be over at some point. We I just want to assure everybody that it is going to happen at some point. Uh, I've also I've been getting up to date information from lots of different sources, and uh, there are different schools of thought, but there is some school of thought right now that, that we may see the peak in about 15 days. And um, on a nationwide level, and if that happens, then things will start to turn, turn back the other way. But one thing that seems certain is that it's going to take us at least a good uh, four to six weeks at least before we get through the difficult uh, situation we're in right now. So um, let's, we, hope, we think the next two weeks are going to be difficult and challenging um, numbers-wise. Though we haven't seen, I have to say from Foxborough side, we have not seen that as yet. So I'm, I'm pleased to see that people here in Foxborough are doing their part to, uh, to maintain social distancing and, and keeping and staying inside and following the guidance that we've been providing. One thing I do want to say is that uh, just as a reminder that you know, the parks are officially, the, the, the land around the parks is actually open, but the, the, but the equipment in the parks is not open. And so I want to encourage kids if they do go out and parents, please be aware that kids should not be hanging on the equipment, should not be using any of the equipment in the parks during this during this time because it it can become you know a collector of of um, of the, of the uh, potentially a collector of the virus. We don't want to be spreading it from one person to the next in the community that way. We do want people to enjoy the you know get out and enjoy the good weather while they can. Actually, one of the things they say is that, is that actually getting a good, um, a good outside, a good walk outside in the healthy air is actually a good thing, and keeps people healthier uh, in many in many ways other than just the COVID-19 way. Um, a couple things that I think have been uh, are important for people to know, and that we are working on on a, a couple items that have actually been done through the legislature, and that is that one of them is 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 to give people some some um, uh, some help on the tax side. Um, we, uh, we obviously everybody still has to pay their taxes, but one of the things that uh, the legislature has allowed uh, cities and towns to do is to provide some relief on penalties if, in fact, they're if they're actually coming if the taxes don't come in on time, um, and that can be and that guidance has been provided for up to June 1st, um, so that we we will be looking to try and invoke that uh, possibility, and I'll be back to the board to see if, in fact, you actually want to support that that effort because uh, that's something that is allowed in the new legislation that has come out. So I think that's something we have to look at given the fact that you know, folks you know, are uh, out of work in some cases and, and, and certainly challenged by, by what's going on. And, 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 to, and to that point too, uh, some folks have not even actually received their unemployment compensation and nor have they received the, the, uh, the assistance from the federal government that's been just approved uh, through the most recent federal action of the $2 trillion um, bill that was just passed. So that should be forthcoming in the next two weeks, but it's, if we, I think if we were to give people, folks, um, some, some a break up until June 1st, that would certainly be helpful for the local uh, residents to uh, to help with their tax, the payment of their taxes. Um, two other, uh, one other thing. This is on. This is on a happy note. Um, I'm informed that uh, that the JC is working with uh, 
with the Easter Bunny. And then we'll be doing some, some visits in Foxborough on April 4th. Um, hearing that um, from, from 9 a.m. to 12 a.m., uh, 12 noon time, that the Easter Bunny will be in town in Foxborough and that they'll be making appointments to see the Easter Bunny. Now, this year it's going to be different because the Easter Bunny is going to be actually be driven around town in a car so that, so that they will be, and they'll be able to maintain their social distancing and that and, and the kids that are going to be looking to see the Easter Bunny will have to stay in their yards and, uh, and, not, uh, and there'll be no contact, of, co of course. But... But that's something that's uh, was just announced today that I that I've been following, and uh, I think it's a great idea, and I think it's good to see that they modified their their approach this year with the Easter Bunny, so that so that the kids know that that Easter is still coming this year here in Foxboro. Uh, so just uh, folks want to put that on their on their on their uh, on their calendars. Two other uh, business pieces of business that I the board needs to needs to contend with, uh, and this will come up during your next meeting. Is that we had did have an unfortunate liquor violation uh, that occurred um, uh, at uh, 79 Summer Street involving a minor and sale sale to a minor. Uh, so I, the board um, will want will want to hold a hearing on this particular item uh, to to deal with this situation and uh, to see if in fact you want to set a date. And then um, that's my request to you is to actually set a date for this hearing. And I'm hoping that we can get this done by the next by the 14th. Uh, that's involving a uh, liquor violation at the Quick Stop Beer and Wine um, location at 79 and 79 Summer Street. The other item is a, uh, a dog hearing, um, which was submitted to me uh, by the animal control officer to actually hold a, a hearing involving a dog that was uh, actually is actually deceased as a result of a, another dog attack. And so that uh, that will be coming up uh, uh, at your at your next meeting on the 14th as well. So two unfortunate pieces of business that we still have to transact, even during the difficult times, but something that uh, that we we, we have to, we'll have to deal with and uh, and deal with uh, at the next meeting. All right. So just want to make you aware of that. Thank you. Other than that, we'll continue continue to wish everybody to stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, we'll continue to, we'll t we'll continue to be here for you to to help you in any way we can. Um, I will continue with the daily updates on Facebook Live, uh, again starting at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Our next one will be at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning with the latest information on the COVID-19 impact in Foxborough. Thank you, Bill. Uh, anybody for uh, Selectman's update? No. Um, only thing I would suggest, Bill, you know, when you're doing that, um, and, and probably, obviously, uh, everywhere that uh, town meeting and elections have been postponed, um, yeah. date to be determined, maybe spread that, mention yeah. that tomorrow morning, and that. certainly every possible outlet we have uh, just to get the word out there that uh, that has been postponed to a date probably in June however you guys want to word it uh, and then just uh, one one piece of, of information that I wanted to share with everybody this is on a personal note that um, I am going to be working remotely for the next two weeks uh, from my house uh, and, and, and in lieu of the fact that my daughter just joined us from New York this uh, this evening uh, with her with her daughter, her 18 month old daughter, um, was most escaped from New York, uh, which is uh, obviously a, a big concern. But I'm really glad they they're okay. Uh, I worry a little bit about my son-in-law who's still there, um, but uh, obviously we see the, the situation evolving in New York. But as a, out of abundance from a, for the staff members in our office and throughout the town hall, the remaining staff members, I certainly don't want to put them in in any way in any harm's way. They are not they do not have any symptoms at this time, and so. Um, I'm hoping they stay that way, and, and if you know, things continue to evolve in that right direction, I'll be back and, and continuing to, uh, to uh, provide service and updates to the town. My work for the town will not stop throughout that time frame. I'll continue to provide the updates from town. The, co the, the, the COVID-19 updates on a daily basis will continue from my house, in my house office at this point. So just want to make everybody aware of that. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, action items? Uh, oh, could I just have... Uh, something sure commission uh, is there any way at the next meeting that we could potentially talk about opting in to mass general law 9017 C uh, that's in regard to speed limits and business districts and I know uh, it could call for a reduction from 30 to 25 miles per hour in the uh, what a business district would be and I think a lot of communities have done that in order to try and prevent collisions involving 
uh, pedestrians and bicycle users. And I'd like to just get some information that uh, the board and myself could learn more about it and potentially uh, the process that we would need to do and in order to enable it. I think the first order of business will be to define what the business district is. Right. So I think that's something we'll have to take a look at, looking at some maps and some aerial maps to define that. Um, certainly adopting the, the, the law, it seems to make good sense, but there is, the, the, the question always is where, what is the area and where is it defined? Right. So I think that's something we'll have to talk with the town engineer, uh, your new town engineer, by the way, who's actually, what a way to start work, right? Yeah, right. Um, and, he's, uh, and so we'll, we'll work with him and, uh, and Paige probably to, to look at some areas that we can def help define that. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. Chief, yeah. Chief, what is that Mass General Law number? Chapter 90. Uh, Mass General Law is Chapter 90, Section 17C. Thanks. Hey, Doc. Yeah. Sorry, I did forget something. Um, when you had asked us earlier too, um, the housing coalition meeting that was scheduled for April 2nd is now tentatively postponed until May 7th. I don't know if that's gone out yet, Christine. I know there's a lot going on. There's plenty of time to still do that, but I, I, just I in got, case you haven't seen that. I think I got a notice. Okay. But we'll double check. Which one was that? The, uh, the housing authority. Housing. Housing coalition. Housing. Not housing authority. The housing coalition, which housing is different coalition. than the housing authority. So um, you remember how we had like the panel that came and and things like that, and the one that was at the council on aging with the dinner. Those that meeting, the next one was going to be April second, which is now pushed off until May seventh, tentatively. Okay. Thank you, Leah. That could be a good one for your updates too, Bill, tomorrow. Yeah, May, uh, that the Housing Coalition moved from May 2nd to, uh, April 2nd to May 7th? Yes. Okay. Uh, action uh, items? Now the action items. Uh, motion to approve tuition reimbursement for Officer Scott Dion in the amount of $1,849.50. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion to approve tuition reimbursement for Lieutenant Ken Fitzgerald in the amount of $1,849.50. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Motion to approve a charity wine permit for the Sage School virtual wine auction on Saturday, April 4th. Second. Any further discussion? So they change this to a virtual one? Yeah, yeah, it's really pretty cool. How does that work? I know I asked Christina too when the agenda came out, but I, I looked at the application, but does that mean they're just selling them and you can come pick up wine, like like a package store? No, I, I think they were actually gonna have um, vintage wines from what I understand and auction them off. Okay, all right, they're gonna auction them off virtually, yeah. gotcha, okay. Yeah. Is this, did this get run by Chief Grace? I mean, is this legal to do a virtual? I don't know if it was run by Chief Grace, but I know that we did run it by the ABCC and they were fine with that as long as it was in the, the operating hours of yeah. a normal package store, which it's going to be. Okay. All right. All those in favor? Motion to approve a donation of $30 to the Veteran Services from John Lacey and David Nathan Lacey. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion to approve a donation of 35 $119 to the Boyden Library from Lakeview Pavilion to purchase museum passes. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Motion to approve a donation of $34.95 to the Boyden Library from the Foxboro Garden Club to purchase a book in memory of Laura R. Sobel. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Motion to approve a donation of $200 to the Com Foxborough Commission on Disability from Nick Riccio. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Motion to approve the December 17th, 2019 Board of Selectmen meetings. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? 
Aye. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Bye, Leah. Bye, guys. Thanks. Night, Leah. Have a good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Stay safe.